Hello class, this is your instructor Patrick Brooks. Uh, today we're going to be going over the DIA diagramming software that we are going to be using for the ER diagrams. Now this is a required, it's uh, not to worry, it's very easy, very intuitive. Uh, it'll help us get things done a lot quicker before. Uh, the reason I mandate the use of DIA is some students were using Visio and, and Word to draw the diagrams. And uh, Although there are ways of doing it correctly in Visio, when a lot of the students were using Word, it was impossible for me to insert comments because the diagrams become undone once I press enter and once I start typing in the area. So we are going to get around that. We are going to create diagrams. We will export them as images and then insert them into our homework file. So that way it's, it's easier for me to comment and, uh, and I can respond as needed. So all right, the first step, of course, is to download and install it. This is easy enough. I sent out a link. It's not you can just search for Dia. It's on SourceForge. And it's available for Linux, Windows, and Mac, so everybody should be able to use it. OK, so you know, we see I've, I've got the software open here. Now, default here, when I opened it, was flowchart. But if we click the little drop-down box here, we are going to be using ER under other sheets. So these are the tools that we're going to be working with right here. Okay, so we're going to make a little, a couple of simple ER diagrams. And so our first step is to create an entity. Now, how we do that, we come over here to the E in the box, and that's an entity. So you can see a little toolkit says entity. So I'll click on the button, come over to any blank area here, and go ahead and insert it. Okay, so there we've, we've gone ahead and created an entity. And if I want to name this entity, I have two ways I can do it. I can double click on it, or make it a student entity. Or I can right click and go properties. OK. Now, there are a couple of other properties in here. Weak. This will make this a weak entity. You see it double box the entity. You won't learn about weak entities until, oh gosh, I think it's chapter six. But for now, just know that it's there. I will go a little bit ahead of what we learned so far in, in uh, chapter two. Uh, just know that in the future, if you ever wonder how to, if you ever want to remember how to do something, just remember that the tutorial is always going to be here. I'm going to post it in the content area, and it's been emailed out as well. And you can just refer back to this if you ever have any questions or, or need some of the more advanced features and don't remember what they were. It's always in the tutorial. Okay. So I'll go ahead and click it again and, and it takes weeks off. So it takes a week attribute. I can't attribute in the programming aspect. It takes uh, it makes a non weak entity. I wouldn't mess with line width, color, fill color, any of this unless you really want to be fancy. I wouldn't waste too much time on that. Okay. Now, what's an entity without attributes, right? All right, I'll go ahead and place a few attributes on here. So here is the attribute button. I'll click it. Click anywhere in here. There we go. What are some attributes a student could have? Um, name, right? We'll need to have some kind of key, I guess. It could be a social security number or even better, student number. Okay. Now, student number is a good primary key candidate, right? There we go. I went ahead and clicked key, and it will turn this attribute into a key. It'll go ahead and underline it for me, which is a way of showing the primary key. Okay. In the case of a weak entity, weak entities have keys, but they're not complete keys. The reason they're weak is because they don't have enough information to uniquely identify them. So what we do is we take a partial key, a weak key, and concatenate it to the owner's primary key to uniquely identify that weak entity. But anyways, to make it a weak key, you click the weak key button. Yes. There you go. But if there's not a weak entity, if we're going to make a, a strong entity, I'll toggle it back off. Okay. What else could we have? Date of birth.
especially if you have a major, right? We'll we'll have a major. So a number. Now, phone number. Okay. We no longer live in the sixties or seventies. We all have a lot of phone numbers, right? We got cell phones, we got work phones, uh, for those of us still living in the eighties we have pagers, right? So that's the multi value, right? See what I did, I clicked and I toggled the multi valued attribute. Boom. Two of them. Okay, shows me it's a multi valued attribute. Remember, a multi-valued attribute is one for which we can have more than one instance per entity. You know, I can have, I can put, geez, a, a cell phone, a work phone, another phone. Okay, we'll go ahead and put age, right? Okay, now, this is a little special case, and I did this on purpose. Age is defined by date of birth, right? So what I can do, since it's defined by other data, I'll call it a derived, derived attribute. Now, derived attribute an attribute that is defined or calculated by, rather, other data in the database. And age is a perfect example. It can be calculated from date of birth. Okay? Uh, I'm 35 years old. When I turn 36, I don't expect anyone to go manually through any database and update my age every year. You know, if the database has a thousand or even, you know, millions of people in it, as many do nowadays, uh, no one's going to do that. Okay, so instead, there are attributes that can be calculated from other information in the database. We mainly do this for performance concerns, but, you know, again, if we want age, we're obviously not going to keep a static age in there. That's just untenable. Okay? Now, i got to connect the entities, right? Okay? I'll come up here, click on the line button. Place it anywhere. Okay? And it's pretty easy. You click on one end, drag it to where you want it, Wait until the yellow halo appears around the object, release, and do the same for the other endpoint. You attach it to whatever else you want to attach it to. And there we go. Okay. Now this way it follows it around and tracks it. And you get rid of that little pesky arrowhead. I double click the line. And here at end arrow, I'll change it back to line. There you go. And I'll do the same for the others. Now, the regular Windows stuff, Control-C, Control-V, Control-Y, Control-Z, all that works in Gaia. Your clipboard is accessible. I'll go ahead and place these on here, and then we'll do another entity. Now, and we won't really get into this until Chapter 3 and beyond, but we'll go ahead and do a little bit with relationships and, uh, and second entities. So here's a good example here. Right now I have major, which, you know, could be like, let's say major name, okay? Remember, an attribute can only store one piece of information, and that one piece of information is going to be a major name. But let's say we need to develop this further. Let's say in the database we want to have not only the major name, we want the, we want to start storing major department information. Well, if we want to store information about an attribute, that's a clue that it should be an entity, right? So I will excise this attribute and make it an entity. So instead of say department name. I will make a new entity called Major Department, and that way I can store information about it.
and I'll connect the two via a relationship. See the relationship diamond here. I'll click it, click anywhere in the uh, in the grid. So now I've connected the two entities via a relationship. Okay, I'll call the relationship something meaningful. Remember, a relationship should be a verb. So we can say something like majors in, okay? Student majors in department. Department is majored in by a student, okay? Or by students, rather. All right. Oh, uh, gosh, what are some attributes about major, uh, major department? We could say uh, department name. And that's fine for a primary key for department if we think about it because there's not really, there aren't going to be two computer science departments at any given university. That's just not going to happen. We'll say what, department code and something like uh, department phone. And we'll keep that singular. We'll just say their name phone. We'll keep that a, a non multi value. And we'll say something like uh, budget. Each department has a budget, right? I'll make this all visible for you here. All right. And what department code is a good key? I know I said name a little earlier, but since I added code, that would actually be an excellent key as well. So we got student majors in a department. So pretty good so far, but it's actually technically not 100% complete. Uh, as we go on into relationships, we'll see a little bit more about this. Now, you notice what I did here. I connected the two entities to the relationship via regular line, and that's not really what we do. We use the relationship line. Okay, and we do the same for it. We drag it from place to place and make sure that uh, the things we drag it to are, are you know, yellow halos before we release it. Now, the reason we do this, it has certain attributes that we can, and I say attributes from the programming aspect, that we can uh, turn on or off. There we go. I just made that a mandatory relationship by toggling the total. Yes. Okay. So now that's a mandatory relationship. Students must major in a department. That makes sense, right? If students have to have a major. You know, I guess they're non-degree seeking students, but we'll kind of uh, leave that argument aside right now. So students must major in a department, and a department must have students majoring in it. Makes sense, right? Okay, we can go a little bit further. 
the relationship, if we double click it, we have our cardinality. There we go. Students must major in a department. A department must have one or more students majoring in it. Okay. Now again, if you're if you're watching this and you've only completed chapter two, don't stress too much about this. Just know that this is here. Okay. And watch this. If I run out of room and I want to make my diagrams a little bit neater, uh, let's say I have to create some vertical links for some reason. Let's say I have something like this. Of course, that's not very pretty, but just for argument's sake. If I click the rotate button here, there we go. Now, my student still has the end cardinality, and my major part is still the one cardinality. So that's accomplished via the rotate button. And if this is a weak relationship, if it's a relationship between, between a weak, let's say for argument's sake, if student is weak, it's not. Obviously, because we have a real primary key, but let's say student were weak, then I would make my relationship weak. I would click the identifying button. And there you go. Okay. Now that's pretty much it there. I'll go ahead and control Z back here for uh there we go to get where we were. Uh, that's pretty much it there. There there are a couple of other little tricks that may help you and I'll, I'll show you right now. Text, if you click on the T button up here, that's text. Surprise, surprise. You can click anywhere and start typing. So if you want to make notes, you can just drag it wherever you like. Now the green dot here, I can double click and uh, I can center it, and that way the green dot is your center. Okay. And one more thing that you may benefit from, if you look up here, you will see the arc symbol. When we cover generalizations and specializations, and I think that's chapter eight or so, if I'm not mistaken, we will need this. I'll click on it. Make it a regular arc without an arrow, and I will drag it to where I want it. And I can play with it like so. There we go. Subclass, superclass, generalization, specialization, relationship right there. Okay. Just remember that the arc symbol is there for you to use. Now we can save this. There you go. And I can browse to whatever picture I want, or to whatever folder I want, rather. Okay. I'll just save it as that gray one for argument's sake. Okay, and now I'll save it as a picture. So I'll do File, Export, mm -hmm. and I will save it as a PNG. Okay. Save it anywhere you want again, and save. So remember, File, Export, Save as PNG. And there you go. Now it's saved as a picture. And I can simply do the uh, insert command from Word or OpenOffice. Or I can just go ahead and control C and control D and into the document. And there you go. So that's pretty much everything you need to know about SIA. It does have a lot of other tools as you go on to do some other networking databases, such as classes, you will have opportunities to use SIA very much so. You see all of the tools and all the sheets we have to work with. And there are more available. They're available for free download out there. So, anyway, I hope you enjoyed the tutorial. We're again, refer back to it as you as you see fit. And uh, okay, I'll see you at the next lecture.